But I do want to get started because we have an important conversation today that I know um, will resonate with a lot of you. And just by way of introduction, um, at Canopy, we always try to provide a comfortable and we hope a safe space for honest dialogue, um, sharing ideas, sharing some angst maybe. And what I've seen in the last couple of weeks, even I know it goes back further than that, has been leaders like those of you on the call today, um, expressing your frustration and your concerns that you are not able to address the critical issues of salary inequities that we're talking about. We've also seen employees from you know, concessions to public safety to curators uh, feeling the angst because they're not able to earn a living wage in many cases. They're not able to buy a home, pay their rent, or think about starting a family. So there's a lot of frustration and a lot of angst around but there are also some silver linings here. And I know how hard you, a lot of you have been working on this. So I hope today's conversation uh, will open some new ideas for us all and share some, perhaps some solutions. Uh, we have a diverse mix on our panel today and in the room. And I really am grateful to see that. So just a quick introduction of the panel and then you'll hear more from them in a few minutes. We have Mike Weilbacher. Malin White. Uh, we don't have Tom yet, but we will have Tom Kehoe from Yards Brewery, Yards Brewing Company in Philadelphia, and Kara Newport. So we really have uh, a great mix here. We have a, an environmental education center with Mike, a nonprofit 501c3, Malin, who is with North, New York, North Carolina Aquariums, state governance with a support group, Tom a for-profit uh, medium-sized business in the city, and Kara, who is a nonprofit botanic garden and historic house. So with that in the room, and those of you I, I see on the screen and in a registration list, um, I think we'll have some great and lively discussion. So logistically, um, if you will put your questions in the chat, if they occur, occur to you at any time, chat is open, wide open. I wish we could say we had coffee there, but we only have chat. Uh, so please enter your conversation there or at the uh, when we do participant question and answer, just raise your hand. We're going to start this way today. I've uh, asked uh, Gabe Buckley, Canopy's business analyst, to kick us off giving some context. Then we'll turn to the panel who will each um, in turn share where they are right now in their journey on this, and then we'll open it up to uh, participant questions. So Gabe, do you wanna take over? And I'll monitor the waiting room, thank you. And we all are so. Thanks, Kathy. And thanks to all our panelists too, it's gonna be great to hear from you. So like Kathy said, um, I'm the business analyst for Canopy Strategic Partners. And my job is to sort of just put all the data together and we have access to a ton of different data sources, um, and one thing that kind of stirred this webinar was we started doing compensation studies and really looking at compensation at different levels. Um, so what are we talking about when we're talking about the living wage versus the passion tax, right? Um, the passion tax is something everybody in this webinar is probably familiar with. Um, it's sort of the price we pay for doing something that we love. And it can be sort of a real cost in, in terms of a lower wage, or it can be sort of an intangible cost if you, you know, take a longer drive uh, to get to a place you really want to work, um, or if you make other sacrifices. Um, so on top of that, um, everyone is sort of feeling the squeeze right now due to the record levels of inflation um, that we're seeing. Um, when we're looking at sort of the industries that our clients are in, you know, we have keepers, um, aquarists, food and beverage personnel, um, gardeners, um, anybody sort of on the lower end of the pay spectrum, they often feel that inflation the fastest and the hardest because it can sort of make the difference between living in debt and being able to save money um, for the future. So it's, it's sort of an immediate change. Um, so we, we have a lot of clients who want to look at sort of that bottom layer. Um, so what I have on the screen right now is AZA keeper compensation by region. And if you're part of the AZA, you've probably seen this already um, in some other form. This comes straight from the AZA's compensation survey um, that they send to all members. And what we're looking at here is uh, the average keeper wage by different regions. Um, and 
we can kind of see that there's, you know, a general trend. Um, it's the lowest in the southeast and the highest in the far west. But what we really like to, you know, we, we like to get much more granular than this when we analyze these things. Um, and so we'll start here for the purpose of this group, kind of talking to everybody, and you can kind of pick your favorite region um, or pick a region you're interested in. And we will follow it to the next chart um, where we're going to look at living wage. So on this chart, you'll find your region in the same color. Um, so I'm going to talk about the Northeast Middle Atlantic region just as um, sort of a marker. But we saw that the average keeper wage was $19.20. Um, so that makes it sort of a living wage. Um, oops, excuse me. There we go. So if you're a single person um, and you're making $19.20, you're sort of meeting that living wage. So you're doing all right. If you have um, a two income household with one child, you're going to be struggling a little bit. $19.20 is not going to uh, meet the living wage requirements that you have to sort of support your family. Um, so we also can kind of see some general trends. Um, if you followed the Midwest or the Northwest, you'll find that the living wage is actually um, lower in uh, lower than the keeper average in those. So keepers in those regions might be um, a little bit happier right now. Um, in the Southeast and Southwest, you'll find that the living wages are higher than the average. So that shows that those regions are going to, are really going to be kind of feeling the pinch um, of the pressure of people needing higher wages to live. So, one final thought that, um, you know, this is single, uh, a single person or sort of a two income, one child household. Um, but something else that we can, should consider is sort of a single parent model. Um, single parents have the costliest household model. Um, and a third of all children um, live in single parent households. So when we're talking about sort of meeting our mission and being a part of the community, um, it's sort of bigger than just, you know, what are we paying our employees? You're, you know, you're really tying back to the community. So this is something I've been very interested in for a long time, and I have a cool opportunity at Canopy to really get into it. Um, but what I'm really excited to hear is uh, hear from some of these leaders throughout the industry who have encountered this problem, have seen it more um, specifically in their own organizations, and we're going to see what sort of problems and solutions and um, stories they have to tell. So. I will uh, turn it back over to Kathy um, and she can kick us off. Yeah, thanks a lot, Gabe. Um, I just saw a couple questions and comments in the chat and wonder if we could spend a minute just addressing those. Um, it, uh, there was a comment that the data here are from uh, 2021 survey, AZA survey, we believe. That and is correct, yeah. If that's correct. Um, in your crystal ball, do you have a sense of how things might have changed since then, or did anyone want to comment on that before we dive into the, the panel? Um, crystal ball wise, we know that inflation has not gone anywhere. Um, so that pressure has continued to escalate on that side. So if organizations have been rapidly adapting to that, um, the, the newer data from 2022 might show um, some significant increases. Um, but it, you know, a lot of people are, it's hard to adapt that fast to a change that large. Um, so it, it's uh, very much, there's no crystal ball. I think it's very important to sort of look at it as each organization and sort of see what your market says and um, how your organization can adapt. Hey, John from Zoo New England, I see your hand up. How are you? Good, how are you, Kathy? I was just going to say in informal talks with other directors, I know a lot of institutions have changed their pay levels dramatically since that survey data came out. And it's not necessarily in direct relation to uh, the in inflation impacts. It was in more in direct relation to the great resignation. And I think that... Um, that brought that was a pressure to be responded to even before inflation seemed to be taking off. So I do feel like the data is old, and and um, I know we and and I've spoken to a number of other institutions have changed a lot since that. 
yeah. necessity. Of course, yeah. And that's, I think that brings up a good point too, is that this data is a little bit old, so it's not um, exactly what's happening now. What we're sort of looking more at is sort of the process of how do we address these you know, large sale, um, like you brought up the great resignation um, and sort of the blog article that spurred this whole um, webinar uh, was one I wrote on the topic where I do talk about the great res resignation and sort of changes in um, workplace expectations. And so there's been a lot of compounding factors. So yeah, I, I hope that, you know, our panelists sort of speak to that as well about all the different changes that happen in wages. And I think we've experienced a lot of them very quickly in the last few years. So um, just kind of get some insights from them on what's been going on. So thank you, John. Yeah, and I just two points in response to that. I, you know, understand that the data are a bit dated at this point, but I would guess and surmise that the relative um, nature of this hasn't shifted a whole lot. I would hope that, as you just indicated, John, that a number of people have been able to respond positively um, in the last couple of years, in the last year especially. The second piece is there is a more in-depth discussion of this um, in a piece, a newsletter piece, a blog piece that Gabe did on uh, Canopy's website. So that explains some of those regional differences. There was a point about um, what states fall into these different regions. Um, so there's a ton of more data there that talks about living wage, living costs, uh, cost to buy a house, et cetera. So we decided not to go into all of that, but the data are available, just, just check that out. Um, I see we still are waiting for a couple panelists, but I think we should just get started here. Um, and I just saw, saw a comment, I wanna call it, Curtis, thank you for joining us today. Curtis Bennett, uh, the great renegotiation. That's a wonderful term, I like to think of that. So thank you for, for that post. Um, I think we'll get started and as, as um, Gabe said, and as we talked about in the introduction, this is an issue that really cuts across. These data are from an AZA keeper study. We realize not everybody here works with animals um, and not everybody works with uh, land animals like we call keepers. Uh, we have aquarists, we have environmental educators, we have people who work at the brewery because it's their passion, uh, as well as the botanic garden. It also cuts across levels. It isn't just, um, you know, at the keeper level employee. These these struggles uh, cut across levels and across organizations. So I'm going to ask Mike um, Mike Weilbacher, who's executive director of the Schuylkill Center for Environmental Education in the uh, in Philadelphia to give us an idea of where, where he is. And I see Kara Newport has joined us too. So hi, Kara. Kara's out at Filoli on the West Coast. And mentioned before we have Malin and um, Tom Kehoe, our brewery CEO will be joining us soon. So uh, Mike, back to you. If you wanna give us an idea, what's, what's going on in your space now? Yeah, and, thank you, Kathy. Uh, thank you and kind of people for the invitation. Appreciate that. Hi, everybody. So um, I direct an environmental education center in Philadelphia. We're in the city of Philadelphia, more than 300 acres. Um, so uh, no live animals to attend to, except the ones that are in the forest who don't appear as often as we want to show them to kids. But uh, we do programming for uh, all kinds of ages. We have a nature preschool um, where three, four, five-year-olds come to school every day in the outdoors. Um, we are an environmental education center and do all the kinds of programming you would expect, uh, walks, field trips, workshops, classes. Um, we also have a wildlife rehabilitation center that takes care of injured, orphaned, sick animals of like 150 species have been there over the years. Um, an environmental art program. So we have indoor and outdoor gallery shows uh, of artists who wrestle with environmental issues. So in some senses, we are four nonprofits in one. We are a nature center plus a preschool plus an art gallery plus a wildlife clinic. Many of those are standalone nonprofits uh, themselves and we're all four and one. So, um, and Kathy knows us well because she was on our board and served as president. So, so we appreciate her service to us. Thank you, Kathy. Um, we had, we, we, one of our signature programs is a summer camp. Um, we've been doing this since, oh my gosh, probably the 1980s. So it's almost 40 years old of kids coming to camp. Probably have second generation campers coming with us uh, nine weeks during the summer. Um, 
the kids, the, the accounts were signed. Uh, I use the word kids because they tend to be college students uh, signed in, on for 10 weeks. We had the most challenging summer in our history from an HR perspective um, in that um, we had summer camp counselors who quit after the first week because it wasn't what they thought uh, it was going to be. Um, in part because little kids are coming out of two years of not knowing how to socialize with each other. And so kids are more challenging in some ways. So give kids open spaces and they, they, they're probably hard to control. So uh, counselors quit. Counselors wanted to go with their parents on summer vacation. Um, we just had just, a, um, just a, a lot of counselors calling in sick. Uh, we did have some COVID cases to have to shut down some, some camp groups. Um, so essentially we were, the full-time staff were essentially spending the whole summer filling in, plugging the holes in the dike from the camp staff, which you've never had to do. Separately from that, we did get a bad case of great resignation um, this year too. So we've been struggling with that. So a big chunk of the permanent full-time staff moved on uh, during the course of the calendar year, the last calendar year too. So, um, so we've been hit by a number of challenges on this side. Uh, we also struggle with our business model. We don't charge admission. So people come to our center for free. So we try to capture them through memberships, program fees, books, you know, gift shop sales uh, and all of that. So um, we did have a group, we did form a group uh, of staff and board who talked about um, HR issues and their unhappinesses. Uh, we have been addressing that really hard uh, we did do, uh, in the new fiscal year that began July 1, we did offer a 6% raise, which is the biggest that uh, we think we've ever offered at one time in a very, very long time. It doesn't, of course, match the, um, the, the inflation rate, but it was an attempt to begin to keep up. So uh, it's, it's been a huge struggle for us. So I think, Kathy, that's a good place to start. But I, I can circle back to any of this anytime. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, we, we just want to kind of introduce the issue and that was perfect, Mike. So, and I see Tom has joined us. Thanks for coming in there, Tom. I know you had another meeting right before this, so we'll give you a chance to catch your breath. And uh, we're going to go to Malin right now, Malin White with North Carolina Aquariums. Give us a snapshot, Malin. Uh, hi, Kathy. Um, yeah, happy to do that. Uh, the North Carolina Aquariums is actually three aquariums and one educational peer. We're located along the coastline of North Carolina, and um, most people like to live on the coast, and that means the living wage is even higher. And so we, we've had to um, deal with that issue. We have 177 full-time uh, employees among the, the different sites. Uh, our, because we are a state-owned and run facility, uh, our department is located in the capital, state capital, Raleigh. That's where I am right now. Uh, so we're spread out, but um, the coastline uh, definitely uh, presents challenges for finding living accommodations. It's probably as bad as I've ever seen it uh, here. Uh, we've even have, have experimented with uh, renting uh, some uh, dorms uh, that uh, may, and make them available to interns and, and new staff coming in just as a, a means of getting them located uh, to the area. Uh, currently, our, our vacancies are, are high. Uh, we've got 11% vacancy right now, and uh, that's been a challenge for us. The, uh, I think one of the, the, one of the unexpected challenges that came up was when uh, COVID hit, we had to shut down to the public for six months. So we had no revenue coming on. We were, we were dependent upon uh, state appropriations to keep us afloat. Uh, and that was successful. But when we reopened, we were, uh, we were directed to enforce a mask mandate and uh, became a very political issue. And our staff, which normally have never had to deal with this, people are happy to come to an aquarium. They're very in very good moods, families, and uh, uh, and all of a sudden we 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 saw a mask rage uh, among our public when uh, we were trying to enforce what we were directed to do. Uh, 
And so that put a lot of pressure on a lot of staff. We had some people leave because they, they didn't want the stress. They, they wanted a place that they enjoyed working at. And so that was a big challenge for us. Uh, the state, the, the, and I agree that I think the, the great resignation uh, was more of a factor than inflation. Inflation is just now starting to add, add into, the, into the mix. And, um, and so we're seeing uh, that uh, the state uh, was able to fund uh, for permanent uh, staff a 3% uh, increase uh, in wage. And uh, they did a competitive uh, study uh, to, uh, to try to adjust, they introduced a new pay plan. Unfortunately, uh, one of the categories wasn't one that transferred easily amongst the other organizations in the categories uh, in the country. And so what happened uh, was it, it was underrated. And so that, that created actually a lot of ill will among staff who felt that they just weren't being appreciated when they saw how, how they went from a, a kind of highly positioned uh, in our organization to uh, a lower uh, status. And so we're dealing with that right now. Um, we were able to get uh, a pay increase for our part-time staff, our temporary staff. And that uh, it actually went across the department. We are a division in the Department of Natural and Cultural Resources. And so that was a good thing, but then inflation and all these other things went on top of it. So it's almost nullified uh, that good, uh, that good bit of work that uh, we were able to achieve. So we've, uh, working with the department, working with uh, legislators, uh, the, we've asked for uh, uh, money to help uh, solve this. The legislatures have given us some money. Uh, we're going to, we're do, redoing our budgets right now. We'll be going back and asking again. I think uh, sometimes you have to hit them repeatedly before you can get some results on that. But uh, our big challenge is that uh, the money that we need to solve these problems uh, is budgeted uh, by law. And, uh, and so we have to get uh, the, the legislators to, to agree. And so that's, our, that's been our big challenge. Thanks, Neil, and we'll get back to you. Okay. Um, Tom, I'm gonna go to you now. And we've heard from um, Mike about the Schuylkill Center. We've heard from Malin about North Carolina Aquariums. What's going on at the brewery? And how, how does you, do your <laughs> issues fit here as pro, trying to provide a living wage in what I understand is also a passion business? Gabe told me that, and we were talking about this. He said, people work at breweries, whatever they do, because they have a passion. So tell me about it. Exactly. So, I mean, what this came up uh, almost a year ago. Um, and what was happening, we had guys that work on the packaging line, work as brewers, and they absolutely love what they do. And they want to make this their, you know, their full time job or their life's kind of job and things like that. And, you know, we didn't really see that as other than the culture of, of the brewery. You know, we have, you know, we have beer there. So it's, a, you know, it's a, it, can, it can be a fun environment, things like that. Um, you know, sort of after work and things like that, and you get to meet people. Uh, I always talk about having a shift beer after work with the guy you're working with, and it kind of gets you to be become friends, and you talk about issues um, because that's what you have in common. You're actually your, your work and what's going on. Um, but what had happened? Um, we start people out. Uh, we did start people out probably at about twelve dollars an hour. Then we brought it up to fifteen. Um, but you know, these guys were like, it's not enough for them to really live on and this is what they want to do with their life and what had happened we had some uh, i guess uh, some union come in and be like oh well we'll get you this much money and you'll be able to live this and and they they these most of these guys are somewhere between 22 and 28 years old and they don't really you know know what that means yet and what happened we told them said we don't think this is a good idea and here's why and we kind of talked to them about what was going on, about what we did. We have a 401k plan, things like that, that, you know, they, they could buy into, which, which a lot of them do, which is crazy at, you know, between 21 and 28, I think that's awesome for their future. But, you know, what it, what it was is like, they didn't, they didn't know enough about the company. They really loved the company and loved what they were doing, but they lacked that transparency, that like that 
personal touch of what was going on. And we did sat everybody down when this was happening and basically did an interview, found out what they liked about the company, what their goals were, you know, did more than just the, uh, you know, the review at the, at, at every six months or the end of the year for, for your, for a raise or something like that. We actually asked, you know, what they thought could make their job better, think, you know, a little, a little more in depth. And we really went through that. And what we, what we found, it's like, yeah, these guys really just want to know more about the company. So what we ended up doing, which really had helped out, we do a quarterly company-wide meeting where we discuss our plans, what, what our goals are, what, you know, what our financials were. And we asked them to all keep it, you know, nice and quiet about what, what we're doing. And we show them exactly what's happening with the company, what we're making, what we had from PPP to come in. And you know, I think they, you know, they have a lot of questions. They learned about EBITDA and found out what that was all about, <laughs> you know, things like that. And it was really, you know, eye-opening that they were like, you know, and they really felt even more part of the company and they were more passionate. And I think, you know, the, the wage and, and things like that, you know, I think we understand where, you know, their mindset was and they wanted to make sure that they weren't going to be, um, you know, taken advantage of and, you know, and, and knowing that, you know, if we're doing well, they're going to do well too. And we showed that in the financials and how that's planned out and how that's worked. And it really, you know, gave a nice solidarity to our group. You know, we lost a few people during that process and some of them were managers that were, were not a good fit that we didn't know about until we started doing those interviews. And once we, you know, got all the, you know, the, what we call the right people in the right seats, it really made sense. And, you know, we just have a so much better company right now because of it. And I'm not saying there's going to not going to be issues, but I think by having the transparency that we do, we're more open to have them come in and ask us questions like, hey, you know, I wanted to find out more about this. And it really has worked for us. So, and oh, by the way, we have 150 employees and, uh, you know, we make beer in Philadelphia. <laughs> They make great beer in Philadelphia, I'll add. So, yeah, and that's something from a non-beer Thank drinker. You. So, yeah, thank you very much. And <laughs> one, just one note, since um, yeah. Tom is the kind of a non-attraction person here, uh, Kara runs an attraction with the garden and the historic house, Mail and Aquarium, Mike with the Nature Center. Tom, on your website, you said that you and your team want to thank the people who make the world a better place. And that's part of your business value. So we really appreciate that. Those of us who work with animals yes. and everything, obviously that's what we think, but thank you for doing that. I'm gonna move over to yeah. Kara. We're gonna get Kara to give us a snapshot of where she is, and then we're gonna do some more Q&A. Thanks, Kara. How's everything in California? We're great this morning. Um, we had a little rain, so uh, then it goes it goes wild here because it's been months. Um, and I just want to comment that uh, my background I you know met Kathy in uh, at the Philadelphia Zoo a, a, a year or two ago, and so I love seeing all the Philadelphia people. And I came to California from um, North Carolina, so um, I was at Daniel Stowe Botanical Garden in Charlotte, North Carolina. So. Um, here at Filoli, Filoli is a historic house and garden and nature preserve. We have 654 acres, um, about 85 employees, and um, we're about a $15 million operation. So uh, mid, a mid-sized organization. Um, our story is, is a little bit different because it started a little earlier than everybody else's since we are in one of the most expensive places to live in the country, um, in the Bay Area. Um, so in 19, um, pre-pandemic, um, we had a turnover rate of 50%. So we were moving through employees incredibly quickly. Um, most of the reason being is that people couldn't stay. People were living in um, rooms, uh, renting rooms. They, they weren't able to do more than that, have their own place. Um, and it's just not a sustainable situation. So um, so that combined with, we had just launched our strategic plan. We had a, a strategic goal of attracting and retaining um, talented employees. So a talented team. 
And, uh, and so it's hard to achieve that goal when everyone's leaving. And, um, and then uh, we had just launched our um, DEAI efforts with um, the American Alliance of Museums Facing Change Initiative to diversify our board and then, you know, our staff and have a policy and plan in place. Um, and what, what we realized, um, and that, you know, the pandemic is an inter interesting timing um, for us in this because it actually allowed us to move through our plans a little bit more quickly. But what we realized is that but um, we, we really had to make a dramatic change. Um, combined with that, and I saw a few of my public garden colleagues on this, um, on this webinar as well, um, there was a conversation in the public garden world, similar to you know, zookeepers and, and uh, educators and other professionals um, about you know, how, how can we attract more people to the industry? How can we retain people in the industry? Um, and how can we, uh, you know, wh what, and then there was a conversation about, well, what are we paying people? And um, it started with, our, who's paying their horticulturist minimum wage or higher? Or higher than minimum wage, and it was a stunning question to me because I, you know, I, I understand the passion tax. I'm a I'm a career nonprofit person myself. I've been um, subject uh, to it and embraced it at different points in my career. But I thought, uh, wow, you know, if we're trying to attract people to this this industry and we're all, you know, underpaying our employees. Um, in our core profession, then then we have then we have an industry problem. Um, so we started uh, down a path that started with a compensation assessment. We were going to start with a compensation assessment. And of course, we did, did the usual. We started comping against um, public gardens, museums, like industries. And one of my board members said, um, ask who we were comping against and said, aren't, aren't we tacitly agreeing in our industry to underpay our staff? And um, it, was, it was a really poignant question at, at the right time. And I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, especially when, which I knew this, um, where our uh, minimum wage at that point for our organization was $18 an hour, which sounds really high, but our cost of living is just a different scale. Um, and, I, you know, we thought we were doing great, right? We thought we were really pushing the envelope with that. Um, and, but what I knew is that the living wage report for our county had just come out and a single household was $28. And so I told this to the board member and he said, well, sounds like that's a good place to start. And, um, and so we, uh, in, 20, um, in 2021, we implemented a living wage as a minimum wage. Um, so we have made a commitment in our compensation philosophy to always mimic the single household living wage for our county as the minimum wage of our organization. So that was $28 last year. It's $31 this year. Um, and, and what it does is um, it, it, it's uh, the living wage is, is reflective of inflation, right? You don't have to keep up with cost of living is adjustments. You don't have to look at inflationary factors. You just keep up with the living wage. What does it cost to pay someone to live here? Um, we had also talked about housing and, and things like that. Um, and we realized that we, you know, we, we can't do that. We should just pay people to be able to rent an apartment in our area. Like that's all, that's, that's, a, that's all we can do. Um, and then this year we have taken our second step, which is ensuring that um, we're comping against all industries in our region. It's a regional compensation assessment instead of a national industry compensation assessment. And, um, and then we're paying everyone, their base rate is 50th percentile or higher. So in the course of two years, um, my lowest paid employees last year received, uh, in 2021, received a 45% increase in, in their salary, and this year received a 12% increase in their salary. So it, it's a dramatic organizational change. The one thing I will add as a caveat is we did reduce our staff by 20% during the pandemic, um, and, and basically we didn't bring them all back. Um, so we opted to have fewer people who stay longer. Um, and I really liked what Tom said, you know, we're, we're really transparent about this. We make sure we have the right people because we want everyone to stay. It's a, it's a different philosophy. And, um, and so we have fewer people who, who we're committed to staying longer that we pay a higher rate and it's actually working out. And I can, you know, talk more about the impacts of that, but that's where we are. Wow. Uh, that's pretty impressive, Karen. Congratulations on that. That is a big, bold step. Um, 
I want to, um, Gabe, if you could just take a look at the, the chat there. I have a, a just a general question. I'd like to toss out to the panel first for some answers, and then we'll go to the, uh, to the chat and see who else uh, has a question here. I would really like to, we've, we've heard some solutions. It sounds like Kara's team, um, her board was very supportive in, and actually um, pushing a little bit there um, to do things a little differently. Um, obviously, it's a very different environment than we have in the city of Philadelphia and also North Carolina, et cetera. Um, but what are some other um, tactics or, or ways you're working to try to fix things? Um, I like Tom's issue of being more transparent. It, we know that it never, it doesn't hurt to share information. It usually helps. Other other uh, solutions oriented from our panel first, um, Mike Malin. Mike, did you want to? You're unmuted there. I got you. I did. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, we did uh, ask a consultant to do a compensation study for us, so we get um, a sense of how other uh, nonprofits um, are are paying their comparable staff. So we we have commissioned that study to see where we fit within that universe. Um, I was really interested, Karen, what you were saying. And of course, was my first question was how you paid for that. Um, and you did mention about a smaller staff and I, you know, I'm sort of a, trying to internalize that. Um, but also, um, we're also making a commitment to changing our budgeting process in that uh, up until now, the budgeting has been done by the department head. So the head of the education department, proposes a budget for that department, the head of development proposes a budget for how they're gonna do with membership and donations and grants, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We have eight different departments across the organization. So we put all the budgets together and then essentially the senior management team hammers out the balanced budget. But what we're gonna do instead is bubble it up differently. And so that the entire education department, all the people on that staff will begin to create a budget together all the nature preschool teachers will work on their budget together. So they have more buy-in at the front end of how a budget is built and not just passively receive a budget um, from senior staff. So we're gonna, and, and I think it also helps demystify um, this process. Another piece is that the staff have said they want more access to the board or wanna know who the board is. Um, and so we're, we're finding social ways to introduce trustees uh, in a low key way to staff members. Um, and again, it's a, it's an intent. It's an, the intent is to give more employees broader buy-in across um, the organization as well. We also just finished a staff-driven diversity, equity, inclusion plan for our staff and programming. So how do we get the staff to, and the people who choose to come to our programs uh, to look more like the city of Philadelphia? And that's been uh, a long running issue for, um, for environmental nonprofits um, is to look more diverse, to be more diverse than we've been traditionally. So it's a conversation in the environmental arena for, for more than 30 years. So, uh, but, but again, that was a staff led conversation about the action steps we're gonna take to address the diversity piece. A little bit separate, but again, a, a piece of it is to get broader staff buy-in over a bigger vision for the organization, which we also hope has benefits for people staying on longer. Thank you. Malin, you know, I know you've uh, struggled. You mentioned as a state organization with a support group, you mentioned legislative, your, you know, your legislative challenges. What's going on and what are your ideas uh, regarding tackling that? Well, um, you know, we're, we're looking at anything uh, that was within our power to do. Uh, one of the things we're allowed to do is um, is fold in uh, teleworking as an option for certain positions. And so we're making that available to staff. That's an incentive for some people to stay on if they can work part of their, their time from home. Uh, we're, uh, the state did do a, a, a wage uh, survey and, uh, and it helped some areas and we were able to fund uh, some of the lower positions. So the, the pay grade minimum was raised on, on a number of positions uh, and that helped. Uh, unfortunately, it, it mischaracterized one of a, a really important part of uh, our workforce and, and I don't think it was represented well. So we're having to go back and ask for uh, that to be re-examined. We think that uh, there's a good case for improving uh, that, which included our aquarist. So it's, it's, a, it's an important thing for us. 
uh, we're also working with uh, our society, which is uh, a nonprofit uh, that that if you're a state organization, uh, fundraising is difficult because people pay taxes and they don't want to donate uh, to the state on top of that. And so our society does a, a, a really good job of uh, fundraising. So we're looking to them and they they're able, they're legally allowed to have a lobbyist. And so uh, they're putting together a strategy uh, for uh, trying to educate our legislators about the value of our organization and uh, so that they'll recognize it. They've, they've given a little bit, so I think the door is open. I mentioned that uh, our vacancy rate is 11%. Our department's vacancy rate is 15%. And state employees' vacancy rate is 20%. So this is a unsustainable situation, and it's it's one that's uh, that's pretty broad. So I don't have to argue our position very strongly. They, I think, people fundamentally understand the problem. So the the trick is how do we get the the money in in order to uh, solve help solve this problem. So educating our legislators is one tactic. Uh, also. We're looking at raising our ticket prices. I think we can get some um, money there that'll help this as well. Yeah, uh, Kathy, can I add two two comments to that? Um, I think uh, Malin hits on the point that um, that the, the the two things that we really did to make this happen. The one is we we made a sacrifice in the beginning. We gave up a lot of those vacant positions um, in order to get the positions paid at a higher rate. And I think you know that can be a strategy. And what we found is that we actually made more money because we weren't spinning our wheels all the time. Um, we had we had consistency of employment, you know, within our marketing department, in our sales department, in our you know, in our other departments. It was it was easier to generate the revenue, and then we did increase our ticket rates, um, which I which I think is is you know, in, in my opinion, directly related because we have to place a value on the things that we do in order to value our employees who do those things. So it's, you know, it's the value proposition um, circle cycle in, in all of this. I, I totally agree with what Kara just said about the value. We, if we don't value ourselves, the public won't either. Yeah. Other, other solutions either from or, or baby steps. I realize this is this has been a problem that's been brewing, excuse me, Tom. It's been brewing for a while and we're not gonna solve it overnight. Um, but what kinds of baby steps or in Kara's case, pretty dramatic steps have the rest of you taken to start chipping away at this? And I'll go include our panel in that as well. Just raise a hand or give me a chat. This is a lot harder problem than I thought. So, there, there is one interesting question in the chat from Malin. Um, it's how are you and the society handling pay discrepancies between the aquarium and the society, and like uh, balancing those two organizations? That's a that's a great question. Um, a few years ago, uh, it was they were not coordinated at all, and uh, the society was had access to resources we didn't have, and and we're uh, setting their their salaries without regard to comparable ones on the state side that we had uh, we had uh, come together and worked out uh, what I thought was a good solution where uh, it, it made it more equitable among the two. Uh, however, um, with uh, the the decline in available uh, labor uh, to fund a lot of our temp positions or temporary positions, uh, the society runs our gift shops. So they have uh, staff that they have to hire. Uh, and uh, uh, we found that, uh, I mean, they, they, couldn't, they couldn't staff it. And, uh, and so we agreed uh, that the society could offer a higher wage in order to, to help staff the gift shops. And I use that as, uh, as an argument uh, to help uh, increase the wages on uh, the state side for our temporary employees. And it was, it was a useful argument to have. So I saw another question, I think from Jess, thanks Jess, uh, about equity. You know, we, one of the, it's not directly related to this, but it really is not just equity and salaries, but equity and access. And if we are able to increase our admission prices or program prices, um, how do we go up? It's the valuing ourselves, 
versus ensuring access. Any comments from anybody or Jess, did you want to elaborate on that? Jess from Los Angeles. So. Um, no, I think you, you kind of uh, phrased it really perfectly. Um, you know, just trying to think about, you know, I think there are so many places where even our staff can't necessarily visit with their whole family <laughs> because of ticket prices. Um, so, you know, I'm just wondering kind of how we are, you know, how you're looking at that or balancing that across the across the board as we're talking about, you know, ensuring um, or increasing access to these systemically impacted communities, largely communities of color. Um, and bringing them into this field and, and looking at the welcome and belonging that we can potentially provide. And yeah, go ahead, Malin. Um, one of the things that we were able to do, because um, we had raised our ticket prices uh, a couple of times uh, in the past 10 years, uh, we, we started a promotion uh, using uh, the electronic benefits transfer card that, uh, uh, people who uh, who receive assistance, um, they can they can get a extremely reduced rate. It's three dollars to come uh, visit, and so uh, we found that that has been very helpful. Uh, so we we didn't want to close our doors by raising our ticket prices, but uh, we did not lose attendance when we raised our prices, uh, and and we've seen an increase in people using the the EBT card as well. Good suggestion. Thank you. I, I, I want to touch on, on that too. Oh, was someone else going? Go ahead. Um, I want to jump on that too and just say, uh, you know, I, I think we've we've done the same. Malin and I, you know, we, we've got some symbiosis happening here. We uh, we increased our free programs, we increased our prices, and we added on a layer of of what we call boutique experiences um, that are these high end, behind the scenes, um, usually reserved for a donor kind of experiences that we have the, uh, uh, publicly available, and you know. It's it's like wine and cheese and custom flower arranging for us, you know, that that kind of a high end experience that really generates as becomes revenue generating. And then it helps our it helps seed our development. But I, I want to talk about um, the passion tax concept just 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 a little bit, because I think that um, what. And, and again, we're like, we're a couple years ahead on this conversation because we, where we're located, we had to start it um, earlier. And, um, and, and we really uh, have, have, have decided that that's a, that's a false narrative um, for us. And that, um, and it actually is, it's a, you know, it's, it's a um, privileged concept, you know, that the passion tax is, you know, is real and we should embrace it is really a privileged concept because, um, because only the privileged can are then allowed to have passion, which is um, which is really problematic, uh, I, I think, and, and we think as an organization. So actually leaning into our diversity and inclusion was um, the, the tipping point for us. You know, I think had it not been for us looking at, you know, hey, wait, how can we attract um, people to, you know, the industry to our organization um, to stay in the Bay Area, we're going to have to pay people and we're going to have to pay them in an equitable way. And we're going to have to encourage them to go into the industry. And, and so, you know, that I think that you know, I, I think that passion has um, has certainly has other rewards, but everyone has should have an equal opportunity to working in passion related careers, and um, and I think that was where we really landed on it. And also, um, I think with climate action and with some of the things that are happening, it's like it's funny how they're all tied together in the end. Um, how valuing our influence on some of on some of those. Um, social and climate issues is, is also related because those industries should pay equitably and pay more because it is our future. So um, so I, I just feel like we we have the opportunity to be a nexus and the more of us that that participate in it, the more that people who have um, are in the public sector have data and have information to show the value of it. It costs to rehire people, believe me, you know, we we estimated we spent um, $250,000 a year in recruitment and training costs. Um, so how many people is that? You know, that's that's how you start thinking about it. 
Thanks, Kara. I think that's an important comment. And, you know, Tom, just from knowing you and your background and looking at your website, that looks like something that Yards has certainly paid attention to, working in your neighborhood, in your community, to make sure, make sure they have beer, make sure, make sure you're part of that community. I wondered if you wanted to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. I think it's, you know, we we actually do something called uh, you know, we we have our core values, uh, sort of like integrity, uh, pride and work um brew on to others is one of the big ones that we we do and you know that is you know we do a cleanup day with uh your favorite trash man you know it's a guy who who basically comes out and cleans up neighborhoods and you know we have a lot of engagement with that with because we have a lot of people that are just you know it's like hey i've got more passion than just working at the at the brewery i want to do things to help out and i think that's really worked out for us and the funny thing is with those core values at our annual meeting I was talking or our quarterly meetings I was talking about we actually give out like a you know we name somebody as the uh you know the ambitioner the brew on to others person of the of the quarter you know things like that just you know getting more excited about things and you know we we kind of treat that uh quarterly meeting as you know like one of those sort of like Google meetings you read about, <laughs> you know, like a little, a little bit of high energy, but at the same time, you know, you know, really, you know, going over some good issues. So. <laughs> Thank you. I think, you know, unfortunately, I'm going to do one sort of lightning round quick question. And then um, we, I think there are two or three webinars in this. I've seen issues about equity. I saw a note from Tara at Alaska Sea Life. Thank you for getting up early to join us, Tara, from uh, Seward about dynamic pricing as an issue of related to equity. So I appreciate that. I am going to ask our um, anyone in the room again um, for, is there a great resource that you have discovered in terms of a go-to website, um, your board, or anything that's helping you through this? Second part of that is, are there metrics we haven't talked about? Metrics, obviously, we talked, Kara's talked about attrition. We've talked about comp studies. We've talked about increasing, you know, what percentage can we pay, et cetera. Metrics and resources, a quick one here. John. Employee engagement surveys. Looking at our own data. Great, thank you. Others. Any other metrics or yeah, diversity, resources? Diversity statistics. I, I think that there's a, a an alignment in, in diversity and um, pay and all of these things. One of our responses, Kathy, was to uh, do stay interviews with people who have chose not to move on. Why are you, what's, why are you staying? What keeps you here? And, and then we're trying to figure out great. what the commonalities are. So we're, we've done stay interviews with all our staff. That's a great idea. I like that. Heidi, St. Louis, how are you? Kathy, um, I would say one statistic or one uh, type of data to look at are who's leaving. Um, so I've lost some experienced keepers who've been here for decades more recently because they've gone to positions locally where they get weekends off and more money um, because the fashion tax was too much for their life, their, their kids, their family life or whatever. So it's not just looking at the turnover, but who's leaving um, because I think it's changing right now. Absolutely. Any other quick ones? And then I'm going to turn back to the panel for their final closing words, closing thoughts. Any other resources or metrics you'd like us to think about? One other quick one is we've implemented an anonymous employee suggestion box uh, that's been very valuable. Sometimes some of those older solutions still have a lot of merit. People feel like they can just speak. No. Um, wouldn't it be wonderful, though, if we could create an environment where they thought they could speak? No. And it sounds um, like a couple of you have really made strides in this area in uh, gaining transparency, which doesn't come without risks, I know. So let's go back to the panel for final wrap-up words, and please enter anything else in the chat. And we will be, uh, we have recorded, we'll make that available along with our kind of takeaways. So Mike. Final words. Yeah, um, one more piece that we that we did. We also went back to in person staff meetings. Uh, just was sort of trying to be post Zoom because uh, I think 
this is all exacerbated by the pandemic at some level that people don't know each other. People who work in the same organization don't know each other because they've only seen each other as Zoom tiles. Um, but no, I appreciate the invitation and I was hoping to find more answers. I got more questions, uh, but this has been uh, such, it was been so interesting to hear everybody else um, speak. I really appreciate it and uh, go Phillies. <laughs> Thank you. Malin, you can tell we kind of are Philadelphia loaded here. So Malin, how about you? Final um, words. One thing that uh, we're sticking with, and this is going against what everybody else is saying right now, is the virtual meetings have helped us. We were spread across four different locations, five really in the state. And this is really the first time we've been able to get everybody together virtually. So we'll, we'll always have some form of virtual communication uh, as a result of all of this. I think that's great. There's not one easy solution for all of us. So Tom, final thoughts. Um, I think your, you know, your employees' personalities really make up the personality of the, of the company. And if you look at their, the employees' personalities, is that what you want the personality of the company to be? Um, I think it's so important that, you know, people are really on the same page and, you know, have a common goal and in, in what they what they where they want to take themselves and the company. So and I think go that's good one. <laughs> I see that. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks very much. So Kara. Yeah, I think um, I, I'll just say that I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm happy to to be the guinea pig if anyone wants to try anything. I have a I have an agreeable board, and um, and we're taking a lot of risks, and we're in a position that we can do that. Um, a couple of things that we've added in, we're doing, so, uh, we have a sabbatical program now and we reduced the time period to five years. Um, so a paid sabbatical in five years, which is a big deal. You know, people work hard and they're tired and it's an emotional energy that's not just about time. Um, and, um, and the other thing I just want to say is that um, I think I think the data helps, right? I think that was persuasive to my board and um, and I've shared um, a lot of our information with the public gardens industry. It's why I'm here today. And I also did a, an AAM blog that you can find. Um, and you know, it's always good to like slip those to, to key people um, to show what other organizations are doing. I know I know not everyone can take the the risk that we took. It was a a $2 million over two year risk. Um, so it's, it's a big risk and a permanent risk and, um, and it worked out for us and it's still working out, but it may not next year. Right. So, um, so we, we just have to keep an eye on, on where this is going, but for now I have a great team and I couldn't say that in 19 because I hardly had one. So, um, so it made a difference for us. Great. Thank you, Kara. And I will say that, you know, I saw Kara's blog, uh, the article in the AAM newsletter, and knowing Kara, I kind of dived into that and I thought, well, it's nice to see some solutions, recognizing that they will not work for everyone and recognizing the boldness and chutzpah that took to actually um, dig that deeply and make that commitment over time. I think 2023, I'm not an economist, I'm not a business analyst, Gabe, looking at you, um, but I know 2023 is going to be a lot different when some of the tax implications for publicly funded um, uh, companies uh, start hitting, you know, when they see their tax bases erode, uh, perhaps or not. Um, so it's going to be different. But I do appreciate and I want to thank our panelists very much. Um, it's been a delight to work with you, Mike, Mail, and Tom, Kara, and Gabe. Thank you for the, the background on this. And thank you all for being here. Please do look for this. Uh, we will include a link to Kara's article. It has a lot of good information, more than we could include today. And we'll include, make sure we include the link to uh, Gabe's background um, article. So thank you very much for being here and we'll see you next time. Enjoy. Thank you. Thanks everybody.